Wouldn't, I wouldn't be seen to be the person who was uh, delaying things as long as they have been since I've been around for as long as they've been delayed. I escaped the jurisdiction and went to uh, North Carolina. Uh, I have been there for the last three months uh, in the hope that uh, while I was away things could get finished and uh, we seem to be uh, getting in that direction. And uh, so uh, I bring y'all, or y'all who have uh, had the temerity to stay around to this time, greetings from North Carolina, the home of basketball, Baptists, and uh, warm spring sunshine. Uh, where, you may be asking, are these new rules which have enjoyed such a long gestation period? A major step in their birth, take to birth uh, took place last Wednesday evening when the final version uh, the final English version of the rules was approved by the Rules Committee. Yes, Virginia, there are to be bilingual twins. The parent statute, the Courts of Justice Act, is presently before the legislature and is scheduled to go before the Justice Committee on Monday next for clause by clause consideration. It's anticipated that the rules will be distributed uh, to the profession uh, by April and that both the Act and the new rules uh, will come into force on January 1st, 1985. When this lecture series was planned, it was uh, optimistically assumed by your planning committee that in fact the, uh, the rules would by this time have been available and widely distributed and be everybody's bedtime reading. Uh, that hasn't occurred. I had planned to discuss a few provisions in depth. Uh, given that the rules are not yet available, I think the most useful thing I can do is to give you a, uh, an outline or an overview of some of the provisions of the rules which will affect evidence in civil cases. Looking at the title of this paper, you may well have asked, what have the rules of civil procedure got to do with the law of evidence? Surely the subjects are distinct. They come in different textbooks, and we took them in different courses in law school. Indeed, you may have said to yourself, what business have these newfangled rules got to do tinkering with the law of evidence? And if your memory takes you back to 1967, you may recall a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal in Sicostra and Lilly in which the court struck down as ultra vires a rule that dealt with an aspect of evidence which had to do with the uh, compelling of the production of medical reports to the opposing party on the ground that the rule purported to change the substantive law and hence was beyond the powers of the Rules Committee. Given the Sacosta decision, you may take the argument further and say that if the new rules regulate the law of evidence, then they're probably invalid. Well, before describing the impact of the new rules, let me first deal with these preliminary but important issues. When we think of the law of evidence, the law of evidence, we think of the body of rules that regulate proof at trial and particularly the admissibility of evidence at trial. But a moment's reflection indicates this conception is too narrow. The law of evidence is concerned at least with the mode of proof at any hearing, whether the hearing be outside the courts altogether, for example, an administrative tribunal, or in the courts but not at trial. For example, the hearing of interlocutory motion in a civil case or a preliminary hearing in a, trial, in a criminal case. And even this expansion of the definition may not be broad enough. How do we characterize the rules that deal with the generation of evidence through the process of discovery, which typically involves no hearing at all? The rules relating to the scope of discovery, many aspects of which we've just heard discussed by uh, John Lorne and Robert, uh, relating to the scope of discovery, whether or not we characterize them as rules of evidence, have an enormous impact on what evidence will be adduced at the trial, for they often determine what evidence will be available to counsel. If we view the law of evidence as encompassing the rules of proof that are applicable to motions and those governing the scope of discovery, it becomes readily apparent that the existing rules, the rules we have today, are intimately concerned with evidence. But even the present rules do not stop there. They do not consent themselves content themselves with dealing with the evidentiary aspects of pretrial proceedings and originating motions, they reach into the trial itself. In a section of the rules which is actually entitled evidence, they proclaim the general principle that at trial all witnesses shall be examined by a vote in an open court, which if you think about as the cornerstone of the hearsay evidence rule, and provide for exceptions, for example, the receipt of affidavit evidence and of commission and debene evidence evidence, uh, de bene essay evidence and the use of discovery transcripts. Moreover, the present rules authorize a judge to disallow vexatious and irrelevant questions and also regulate when and how the court may obtain the assistance of experts. Hence, we can see that the present rules are quite heavily into the evidence business. And if one looks at the rules in other jurisdictions, in Canada, England, or the United States, one will see that the matters that I have just referred to are typically regulated by the rules of civil procedure. 
So it's on this foundation of the present rules that the new rules build. They regulate essentially the same areas, though as we'll see, often somewhat differently, often more intensively, and often by way of codifying existing practice. But how far may the rules of civil procedure go, even given this impressive historical precedent, without running into the problem identified in Sir Costa and Lilly? That is, the regulation of evidentiary matters may take the rule makers into the area of substantive law, not procedure. The answer the rule makers felt was most unclear. So unclear as to create real problems, not only for those involved in drafting, but potentially for the profession and the courts in working with the new rules and ever having to face the argument that this rule or that rule was ultra vires, the Rules Committee, uh, because it was beyond the rulemaking power. How then should this imp imprecise and unruly dichotomy between substance and procedure be handled? This led to another question. What was the nature of the problem? What was the source of this dichotomy? Is there a constitutional restraint on giving rulemakers power to deal with matters of substantive law? If so, why is it a problem for the delegated legislators who make rules of court, but not a problem for ministers who make regulations, some of which even create quasi-criminal offenses under a myriad of statutes and whose regulations are not attacked on the ground that they deal with matters of substantive law? The answer, of course, is there is no constitutional restraint. The problem lies in the limited legislative grant of power in the present Judicature Act in section 116.10 to make rules relating to, quote, pleading, practice, and procedure. Drafting uh, the rulemaking power in such terms creates the procedure substance dichotomy and invites challenge to the validity of a whole variety of rules. And the potential for challenge, I might add in passing, and for consequent uncertainty is by no means restricted to the, to the procedure evidence dichotomy. For example, is a rule that provides that payment by a garnishee pursuant to a garnishment order is a valid discharge against, discharge against the judgment debtor, which appears in present rule 606, is that a matter of substance or procedure? Are rules that authorize a court to enforce its orders by contempt proceedings, including imprisonment and the imposition of fines, see present rule 569, substantive or procedural. The more the problem was examined, the clearer it became that in drafting comprehensive rules to regulate the conduct of litigation in the courts, the procedure substance dichotomy, given the narrow definition the procedure had been given in the Sarcasta case, was, only, was not only highly inconvenient, but was basically unworkable and was likely to plague litigants and the profession with arguments concerning the validity of the rules. The solution <coughs> that has decided to be adopted is to have the legislature redefine the rulemaking power. This is being done in section 91 of the Courts of Justice Act by providing that, subject to the approval of the Lieutenant Governor and Council, the Rules Committee may make rules for the Supreme and District Court, quote, in relation to practice and procedure of the courts and may make rules for such courts even though they alter or conform to the substantive law in relation to a lengthy list of enumerated subjects. For our purposes, the relevant ones include discovery and other forms of disclosure before hearing, including the scope thereof and the admissibility and use of such discovery in a proceeding, the examination of witnesses in and out of court, motions and applications, the mode and conduct of trials, and the appointment by the court of independent experts, their remuneration, and the admissibility of their reports. Well, after those preliminary remarks, how do the new rules affect evidence in civil cases? Their impact is in three major areas, and I'd like to discuss them under three headings. The first has to do with evidence on motions and applications. Second has to do with pretrial disclosure and out-of-court examinations. And the third has to do with the trial itself. First, with regard to motions and applications, let me just clarify a point of terminology. Applications is the new title that is to be given what we presently call originating motions. The term motion is to be reserved for use in reference to what we today call an interlocutory motion. Like trials, the hearings of motions and applications are occasions for the court to adjudicate i.e. to receive evidence, hear argument, and render decisions. At such hearings, the court has to be informed of the facts and has to make factual findings, but there is an obvious difference between such hearings and a trial. Trials 
uh, are the forum for the resolution of seriously contested issues of fact. Not so with the hearing of motions and applications. Indeed, if on, if on such a hearing a uh, serious factual, issue arise, factual issues arise, the court will direct a trial. Since they are not the occasion for resolving disputed issues of fact, we long ago developed very different evidentiary rules for such hearings. We do not insist on oral testimony. Instead, we have a rule that prima facie evidence, to be given, evidence is to be given by affidavit. To overcome the hearsay problem this presents, no live witnesses available for cross-examination, we permit pre-hearing out-of-court cross-examination on such affidavits. In addition, if a party wishes to present the evidence of a witness from whom he is unable to obtain an affidavit, the evidence may be compelled by the device of examining the witness before the hearing and out of court as a witness on a pending motion or application and using the transcript itself at the hearing. This then is the way that, uh, that proof on motions and applications is generally handled today under the present rules and the new rules don't change that basic scheme. However, there are some modifications to the basic scheme, principally in relation to the content of affidavits and in the direction of more tightly regulating cross-examination on affidavits. Under current practice, the general rule is that affidavits must be confined to the statement of facts within the personal knowledge of the deponent. This rule, the primary thrust of which is to prohibit hearsay, is, however, more restrictive than it need be and narrower than the corresponding rule that is applied to a witness testifying orally at trial. Consequently, the new rules provide that affidavits shall be confined to stating facts within the personal knowledge of the deponent or to other evidence that the deponent could give if testifying as a witness in court. So in future, affidavits may contain admissible hearsay, for example, admissions made by an opposing party, and opinion testimony. This general rule as to the contents of affidavits applies, except where the rules otherwise provide. And with regard to affidavits for use on motions, as today, the rules provide otherwise, in that affidavits may contain statements of the deponent's information or belief. However, under the new rules, there is to be a, a limited extension of this principle in respect of applications, i.e. the present originating motions, in that statements on information and belief will be permitted, but only with regard to matters that are not contentious. Turning my attention to the question of cross-examination on affidavits, during the course of their work, the rule makers heard various complaints of abuse surrounding the exercise of the right to cross-examine on affidavits delivered for use on motions and on applications. For example, excessive delay, in some cases attributable to parties who were cross-examining on the opponent's material before delivering their own affidavit material and thus necessitating a second round of cross-examinations. Unnecessary requests for uh, an adjournment on the day of the hearing for the purposes of cross-examination and complaints of, uh, of simply unnecessary and uh, time-wasting, money-wasting cross-examinations. In response to these complaints, suggestions were made that, as in England and in some other Canadian jurisdictions, the right to cross-examine be replaced by a requirement that leave be obtained before cross-examining on such affidavits. The rulemakers felt that given the Ontario uh, profession's familiarity with uh, cross-examining on affidavits, such a change would simply lead to a flood of motions for leave to cross-examine. Instead, the new rules will employ several specific modifications designed to curtail uh, these abuses. The key elements of the new procedure is as follows. First, a party may cross-examine on his opponent's material only after, ha after he has himself served every affidavit on which he intends to rely, and after cross-examining, he may deliver further material only with leave of the court. Second, the right to cross-examine must be exercised diligently, and the court is given express power to refuse to grant an adjournment for cross-examination where a party has failed to proceed diligently. Thirdly, there are cost consequences which do not apply on applications or to certain types of, of very important motions for example, a motion for summary judgment or a motion for contempt, but applicable to all other motions, and that is the examining party must, if he orders a copy of the transcript, provide a copy free to the opposite parties, and he is liable for his opponent's costs of cross-examination unless the court otherwise orders. Those of you who do family law work 
uh, maybe it will be aware that there are provisions along these lines already contained in the rules but limited to uh, inter claims, motions for interim relief in family law matters. Let me turn now to the second area of the impact of the rules on evidence, which has to do with pretrial disclosure and out-of-court examinations. And I'll group here a discussion not only of uh, pretrial disclosure in the discovery sense, which will be achieved under the new rules, largely through the broadening of existing discovery devices, uh, and also uh, I want to speak here about out-of-court examinations generally, including not only examinations for discovery, but uh, examinations that are designed expressly for taking evidence for the purpose of trial, what we today call commission evidence or Debene evidence, Debene essay evidence. With regard to the scope of pretrial disclosure, the, the rules significantly, as has already been indicated by, uh, by Robert, significantly increase the extent of pretrial disclosure. And while this increase is real, I think it's fair to say that it's modest. And the rulemakers have attempted to avoid the excesses of modern American practice under, under which the potential for almost limitless discovery is now perceived in many quarters in the United States to be a serious problem. Let me give you just one example, and I'll give you several more in a moment, of the way in which these rulemakers steered away from known uh, American uh, problems. The new rules provide that uh, an examination for discovery may now be conducted either by written questions and answers, the use of what used to be called interrogatories, or by, as we do it today, oral examination. And it was suggested uh, to the rules, to the rulemakers, that a party should be able to use both methods, methods of examination for discovery cumulatively. The rulemakers said no, for it is the cumulative use of written interrogatories and depositions, which are the American equivalents, that has given rise to what in that country is called the two waves of discovery problem. First you interrogate your opponent to death, and then you depose him into the ground. <coughs> Discovery under the new rules is broadened, but there are still very real limits. In what ways, then, is the scope of discovery extended? With regard to documentary discovery, there are only minor changes in scope. Insurance policies under which an insurer may be liable to satisfy all or part of a judgment or to indemnify a party for money paid in satisfaction of a judgment are made discoverable, though it is specifically provided that insurance information uh, thus produced is not admissible at trial unless, the relevant, unless it is relevant to the issues in the action. The justification for this disclosure of insurance coverage is that, will, that, is that it will enable counsel for both sides to make the same realistic appraisal of the case so that settlement and litigation strategies are based on knowledge rather than on speculation. The only other important change with regard to uh, scope uh, with respect to documentary discovery is that uh, it will be provided that by court order a party may be required to disclose and produce all relevant documents in the possession, control or power of its parent or subsidiary corporation. Something that can be a difficulty today when the party that you're litigating with uh, is a subsidiary uh, of, a, of a parent company and the documents that you really need to conduct the litigation are not in your defendant's possession but in the parent company's possession and the rules will provide a mechanism for obtaining those documents. With regard to examination for discovery, the rules significantly redefine and broaden the scope of examination for discovery. However, it is important again to note that the general rule, and the general rule is still, is, the, the, the general rule remains the same as we have today, that questions on discovery must relate to the matters in issue. That rule remains unchanged and again, the rulemakers steered away from known excesses in the United States. In the US, the scope of discovery is virtually boundless because the general statement of the rule with regard to the scope of discovery is that discovery may be had as to any matter, any matter relevant to the subject matter involved in the action, and it is not a ground for objection that the information sought will be inadmissible at trial if the information sought appears reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. In the United States, the adoption of these standards has led to a situation 
where effectively relevance is no longer a legal limit on the scope of discovery. Counsel is free to ask any question he might realistically want answered that does not invade the area of privilege. However, the new rules do significantly, the, the new Ontario rules, will significantly extend the scope of examination for discovery. It is specially, specifically provided that no question may be objected to on the ground that the information sought is evidence. Robert's already mentioned that the distinction between facts and evidence uh, is no longer relevant with regard to uh, answering uh, of questions on discovery. Also, it will no longer be an objection that the question constitutes cross-examination, and that will bring Ontario practice into line with the practice in the western provinces of Canada, where cross-examination has long been permitted on discovery, not necessarily pursued on discovery. The question of whether or not one wishes to pursue to cross-examine on discovery becomes a tactical question. The point is that it will no longer be a ground for objection that the examiner is cross-examining. Also, the rules will make discoverable the findings, opinions, and conclusions of experts retained by a party. But this information or the identity of the expert need not be disclosed if the party undertakes not to call the expert as a witness at trial. And again, as Professor Sharp indicated, the qualification there will effectively allow counsel to bury the identity and uh, the uh, evidence generated by a witness that he considers to be unfavorable for the reasons that Robert uh, explained. Note, however, uh, that the, at the discovery stage, the expert's written report, if prepared in anticipation of litigation, still remains privileged under the, uh, the litigation privilege that Robert was discussing. Its production can be insisted upon only on the eve of trial and not during the, uh, the discovery process. Also, there will be imposed by the, the, the new rules a clear duty to make continuing discovery, that is, to disclose information discovered after the examination, and this obligation is not dependent upon whether or not an undertaking to that effect is either requested or given, as under the more recent Ontario cases at present. A major extension of the discovery process is that under the new rules, non-parties, other than experts retained by a party, may be examined for discovery. However, this new procedure is subject to a number of limitations designed to keep its use within reasonable bounds. First of all, leave of court is required. And secondly, it is subject to a series of preconditions. The most important being, and this really relates to, to, really to Robert's, I think the last point that Robert was making about whether or not there's to be a qualification to the uh, work product doctrine-based litigation privilege, is that the examiner must satisfy the court that he has been unable to obtain the information from another party or voluntarily from the person sought to be examined and also that it would be unfair to require him to proceed to trial without examining the non-party. Also, in exercising the, the, the uh, ability to examine a non-party for discovery, uh, there are certain cost sanctions built in. The examiner must provide free copies of the transcript to other parties, and he may not recover the costs of the examination unless expressly so ordered by the court. Again, in this context, it is to be noted that the rulemakers, while making possible where necessary, the discovery of non-parties have stayed away from the open-ended U.S. scheme under which any person, a party or a non-party, any person I may stress in the world other, uh, uh, who is a party or a non-party may be examined as of right unless the court makes a protective order uh, terminating discovery. With regard to medical examinations, the circumstances in which medical examinations may be ordered is broadened. Today, under Section 77 of the Judicature Act, they may be ordered only where a party claims compensation for bodily injury. In future, such an examination may be ordered whenever the physical or mental condition of a party is an issue in the proceeding. And this would cover, for example, the situation where an issue is raised as to the mental condition of a spouse in a custody dispute. This extension is implemented not by the rules, but by the uh, Courts of Justice Act. 
While on the subject of medical examinations, recall that, as Bob Sharp pointed out, that the rules provide for sequential production of medical reports where a medical examination is ordered. That is, prior to the examination, the plaintiff must make available his medical reports to the defendant, taking the typical case, again subject to his right to bury unfavorable reports on an undertaking that he will not call uh, a designated person as a witness, and after the examination, again using the typical case, the defendant must send a copy of the examining doctor's report to all parties. A new procedure is provided for obtaining admissions for use at trial. A party may serve a document called a request to admit, requesting that his opponent admit the truth of stated facts or the authenticity of a specified document. The request may be served at any time but will most likely be used as the trial approaches. The response to the request must be specific unless the response either A, specifically denies the truth of the fact or the authenticity of the document, or B, refuses to admit and sets forth the reason for the refusal, the party served with the request shall be deemed to have made the requested admission. Cost consequences may attach to the denial or refusal to admit, for example, if the fact or document was subsequently proven at trial, the court may take the refusal into account in awarding costs. It is to be noticed that this request to admit is much broader than the notice to admit procedure that's presently provided in Section 55 of the Evidence Act. That procedure extends only to documents and not to facts and merely establishes the correctness or genuineness of copies. Due execution and the authenticity generally must still be proved. By contrast, a request to admit under the new rules may lead to the admission of the authenticity of either the original uh, or a copy of the document. With regard to out-of-court examination, looking first at procedures for taking evidence before trial, the new procedures that will replace uh, commission and de bene evidence, de bene essay evidence. Here there are a number of important changes. The person, a person may be examined for the, purpose as a, for the purpose of having his testimony available to be tendered as evidence at the trial, either by leave of the court or by consent of the parties. The grounds upon which the court may make such an order are considerably broadened and are no longer limited to situations where it can be established that at the time of trial the witness will likely be out of the jurisdiction or incapable of testifying uh, through infirmity. Etc. Now it will be possible to obtain such an order on the grounds of the convenience of witnesses or a savings of costs uh, may also be a sufficient grounds for an order. The examination may be videotaped and since it is likely that the examination will be used at trial in lieu of calling the witness, this is obviously highly desirable. The principles governing the use of such examinations at trial has also been changed. Today, before a party can use the examination, leave of court has to be obtained, and this, re this requires establishing that the witness is presently unavailable or incap incapable of attending the trial. Under the new rules, the transcript or videotape of the examination is admissible unless the court orders otherwise, and the witness shall not be called to give evidence at trial except with leave. So in other words, if we've gone through the process of taking commission evidence, have put that, uh, that evidence in the form of a transcript and a videotape, the prima facie rule should be now that that should be, lieu, that should be used in lieu of calling the witness unless for some good reason the court orders otherwise. The rules deal comprehensively also with the use of examinations for discovery at trial, a matter of course which is also covered by the present rules. For the most part, the provisions continue the present rules or codify existing practice. For example, the reading in of the adverse party's examination as an admission, i.e. the plaintiff reading in the defendant's uh, discovery as part of his case in chief, and using the transcript for the purpose of impeaching a witness. However, here too there are changes. The discovery evidence may be read in at trial whether or not the party examined has testified. And this means that a defendant will no longer have to put the plaintiff's discovery to the plaintiff while the plaintiff is on the stand if the purpose is merely to put into evidence 
an admission made by the plaintiff on discovery as distinct from impeaching the plaintiff's evidence in chief. In other words, today, the plaintiff has the benefit of reading in the defendant's admissions without having the defendant in the stand to argue with him while he reads in the admissions. Under our present practice, the defendant does not have the same benefit because a rule of uh, a court-made court rule requires the defendant to put the plaintiff's examination to the plaintiff if he takes the stand. Under the new rules, the defendant provided all he is seeking to do is to put in admissions made uh, by the plaintiff uh, on discovery, is entitled to read them in as part of his case. On the other hand, if his purpose is to impeach the plaintiff's in trial testimony, then of course the Evidence Act provisions require him to put those provisions to the plaintiff while he's on the stand. A major change will be made with respect to the use at trial of the discovery of a person who is unavailable to testify at trial. Subject to certain limits, either party may use the examination as part of his case in chief. This is generally not possible today in a civil case except where the deponent has died, although the provisions are made in the criminal code for the use at the preliminary, uh, preliminary inquiry testimony of a witness who is unavailable uh, when it comes time for trial for reasons that are beyond the death of the witness. This use of discovery evidence under the new rules is subject to a number of limiting conditions, uh, the most important of which will be the extent to which the person was actually cross-examined on discovery and also to obtaining leave of the trial judge. There are a host of, of uh, other small but interesting changes with regard to examination for discovery and other out-of-court examinations. And here I'm referring to cross-examination on affidavits and examination of witnesses on a pending motion or application. And let me quickly mention them to you. First of all, a party examined for discovery who refuses to answer a proper question or who refuses to answer on the ground of privilege will now do so at some risk. Unless he provides the information in writing, no later than 10 days after the action is set down for trial, he may not himself introduce the evidence refused except with leave. So if a party now wishes to object, if an objection is taken to a question, counsel better think through very carefully about whether or not the information that that question would produce is information that he wants to use, because if he later decides he wants to use it, he will be in difficulty through having objected unless he has provided the information in writing. Where counsel, rather than the person examined, answers a question, the answer is deemed to be that of the person examined, and unless before the end of the examination the person repudiates or qualifies the answer. Uh, the consequence would be that unlike today, uh, such an answer could be used to contradict the examinee should he testify differently at trial. There's case law today to the effect that if counsel answers, uh, that may constitute an admission, but if an admission isn't your problem, the problem is that the witness that you've examined testifies at trial, but testifies differently. You can't use his counsel's answer to impeach that witness. Now the rules will deem the answer, the, the answer of counsel to be that of the witness unless the witness uh, states that he is not to be bound by it. Special examiners are to get a new title. They're to be called official examiners. In return, they'll lose their monopoly. An out-of-court examination may be conducted before any person agreed upon uh, by the parties. The theoretical power of official examiners to rule on the propriety of questions is now abolished, and now only the court may make such a ruling. Also, a question may be, uh, that has been objected to may be answered with the objector's consent and a ruling obtained uh, from the court before the evidence is used at the hearing. Transcripts of out-of-court examinations now will need only to be filed if and when they are to be referred, at referred to at the trial or a day or two before the hearing of a motion or application. And the rules will specifically provide that a transcript is not to be given to a trial judge until a party refers to it and the trial judge may read only those parts referred to by a party. On the consent of the parties or by court order, any examination may be videotaped and the tape filed for use of the court along with the transcript. Now let me turn to the third area that I mentioned, and that is the trial. To a limited degree, 
The rules regulate the two basic methods of adducing witness evidence, i.e. through live witnesses and by affidavit. They also speak to the subject of expert witnesses. The general rule that witnesses are to be examined orally in court by direct cross and re-examination is codified, as is the judge's right to exercise reasonable control over the interrogation of witnesses so as to protect witnesses from harassment or embarrassment and to direct a witness to be recalled for further examination. The rules are innovative on two points with regard to mode of questioning. They provide that where on direct examination a witness appears unwilling or unable to give responsive answers, the trial judge may permit examination by leading questions. The other situation has to do with adverse parties. The presence rules uh, authorize the calling of adverse parties as a witness and is little used and one of the reasons is because that if called, the adverse party becomes, uh, count, becomes a witness for the counsel uh, who called him and of course he has to be examined in chief. The new rules change this and provide that where an adverse party is called as a witness, and here the adverse party will include the officers and directors of a corporation, he may be cross-examined as of right. There is a qualification uh, in, the, in, effectively, uh, in effect applying to uh, a defendant is that if a plaintiff seeks to call the defendant as part of his case in chief, defendant's counsel can stop that from happening by undertaking to call his client as a witness and thereby waiving his right to move for a motion for non-suit at the close of the plaintiff's case. The general power that exists today for the court to authorize proof by affidavit evidence either before or at the trial is continued. However, with respect to the trial of undefended actions, there is a radical change. The plaintiff may prove his case by affidavit in an undefended action unless the trial judge orders otherwise. And this provision should simplify and reduce the expense of many undefended damage assessments. This general rule is supplemented in respect of undefended divorce actions by specific rules. Unless otherwise ordered, evidence relating to reconciliation and the absence of bars to divorce may be presented by affidavit, and where this is done, the judge may conduct the trial and grant a divorce without the appearance of either counsel or the petitioner, a provision which should significantly reduce the cost of trying undefended divorce actions. The new rules contain two innovations with respect to expert witnesses. The first you've already heard about uh, from Professor Sharp, the requirement of disclosure with regard to expert uh, witnesses, with regard to their findings, opinions and conclusions on examination for discovery, and also the requirement of eve of trial disclosure of the report of an expert witness who is to be called to testify at trial. We might note in passing that this, in a sense, is Sir Costa and Lilly revisited. It was a rule compelling the disclosure of expert witnesses' reports that were struck down in Sir Costa and Lilly. The second innovation recalls another venerable case, the case of Phillips and the Ford Motor Company, which involved the interpretation of present rule 267. That curious rule, which uses rather arcane language, authorizing the court, quote, to obtain the assistance of merchants, engineers, accountants, actuaries, or scientific persons in such ways it thinks fit, the better to enable it to determine any matter of fact in question, any cause or proceeding, and may act on the certificate of such persons. The Phillips case, in which the judge invoked this rule to obtain the assistance of an engineering expert, points out the difficulty with the rule. It fails to define the role of the, the court expert either at all or in a manner that's consistent with the adversary system. To overcome this problem, the new rules empower a judge to appoint an independent court expert, either on the motion of a party or on his own initiative, and where possible, the expert is to be one agreed upon by the parties. The rule then proceeds to very clearly define the expert's role. It is to be that of a witness only, and he is not to be some ill-defined confidant of the judge or an advocate himself. The expert may be authorized where necessary to inspect and test property or to conduct a medical examination, but he must prepare a report, and a copy of that report must be provided to every party. 
The report is to be filed as, as evidence at the trial unless the trial judge orders otherwise, and at the trial any party is entitled to cross-examine the expert. This procedure is modelled after similar procedures in some other jurisdictions. The rulemakers do not anticipate that it will be often used, and it evidently is infrequently used in the, the other jurisdictions which, which served as the model. But it may be useful in some types of cases. For example, in a medical malpractice case where a plaintiff has experienced difficulty in obtaining an expert, an expert because the doctors who could give favorable testimony do not wish to be cast in a partisan role but would accept a court appointment. What the rule does is to continue the tradition, albeit little used, of the court itself obtaining the assistance of experts, but in a manner that is consistent with the adversary process. I thank you for your attention, and uh, we can all now go home. Thank you. It remains only for me to thank all of the speakers on your behalf for the uh, effort they've made in producing uh, these lectures. Thank you and see you next year.